We'll draw this to a close by six o'clock, just shy of six. So um, we have uh, uh, some time for discussion uh, amongst the panelists, and uh, and then very quickly we'll open up to the audience. But as one of our ex colleagues here, Michael Ignatiev, used to say, a question is a set of words followed by a question mark. <laughs> so let's uh, hold on to that. <laughs> let's hold on to that and hope for the best. Oh, I want to thank the panel for their excellent presentations. I want to thank the, um, uh, the audience for being here. Um, and I want to thank you, Liza, for the grit and the polit you know, you've really given us a whole structure which, and a, and, a, and a structure which really holds and glues together many of the things we've ha heard in the last couple of days. Because one of the issues that I wanted to ask was something that hits you in the eyes, and everybody thinks that I have a stake in it, so I'll admit I do, is the huge corruption, uh, which is like another form of infrastructure. There is nothing you can plan on if you don't also take that into account. You know, the, the, your presentation this morning made it absolutely clear. You know, it's an open economy of exchange. It's an economy of, of, of evaluation, of regulation at, at, every, at, at every level. And I think that that's been an important issue, but one that we often, those of us who come from the more privileged or who, who, or who study the more like myself, the more conceptual or theoretical things, the more narrative issues, we really don't get into the nitty-gritty of it. And I think the two of you have really put that very firmly. Also, it seemed to me that whereas we had, you know, individual views and perspectives and general perspectives, I didn't hear the, the sort of sound of the populace in a way. You know, there was an, an, a voice that I did not hear, and I think that also was put on the table. And something else that I would like to just put out, if people are interested, we can take it up, is... A democratic practices at the uh, democratic practices, democratic organizations and institutions in places like Dharavi, which are very emergent in the in the politics of the of the city, and how those become part of, get absorbed into, reconstructed by the larger civil society issues. You know, the civil society as it exists between journalists and lawyers and activists of, of other kinds you know what is the conversation across those uh, across those boards is it the same thing are they are they together in this the writers the theorists the this or indeed are there different kinds of vo i mean there, there surely will be different kinds of voices in the construction of civil society but what are its integuments what are its networks where do they cross where do they depart this is some, a, a question that I think is important because it includes people like us here in making these global or transnational links there. And that's what I thought I would just put on the table for a conversation if those of you who may be interested in it or we could move on to other issues. Does anybody want... Uh, Nat. Yes, Nat. One sentence question. What will happen to Dharavi? Some of you were there. What do you think should happen to Dharavi? Well, I think this is your baby. <laughs> but I, I'd like to hear what others say, though, as well. <laughs> but uh, at least work, yeah. The party guys. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know what will happen to Dorothy. I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, something is going to happen. There's just too much interest. There's too much momentum behind the, the current efforts. But whether they'll look like Mukesh Mehta's grand vision, I actually doubt it. I think that uh, what's actually going to be um, pursued is, is going to be much more piecemeal. And uh, um, I think there are too many constraints, some of them democratic constraints, but largely capacity and administrative constraints that will prevent this grand vision from quite being enacted. But I'd like to hear what others How think. many of you know what Mukesh Mehta's grand vision is? 
What is Mukesh Mehta's grand vision? Okay, so Mukesh Mehta's grand vision is to transform this already very densely packed um, mixed-use enclave, residential, industrial, commercial enclave, into a what he's called a knowledge and uh, knowledge center, and uh, to be um, he has an acronym hikes uh, like health, uh, infrastructure, economic or income. Um, there's a K, knowledge and education. And so to be a center for each of these things and uh, by employing the, um, the state's existing slum housing scheme, the financing model entailed in that, that gives, um, that <coughs> allows redevelopment of uh, informal settlements and um, clears land by taking formerly horizontal space and making it vertical and on the adjacent land or what can be sold through markets of TDR um, to um, develop market rate properties that then finance the subsidize what's been constructed for the current slum dwellers. And so Mukesh Mehta's vision is to take this whole area of Dharavi, 525 acres or so, divide it into five areas and have it auctioned off to international developers to redevelop um, one fifth of the settlement into this hikes, this knowledge and health income. But so this, this, if I might ask people to know better, I mean, this has been happening already, hasn't this? That some, not fixed. There's been, not no, in Darby, no, 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 no oh, but in other parts of oh, Bombay. Oh, yeah, the slum rehabilitation That slum, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so, so Nat, I mean, just to pick up on Nat's question and this, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what Mukesh Mehta uh, is doing is operating a legislation or an incentive that exists in the form of the Slum Redevelopment Authority and their scheme, which is given up a, a property which has slums on it, that the developer can develop half of it for bonus FAR and in the other half house the slum dwellers. And the fact that you have to do it only in 50% of the, of the land, roughly, uh, you, you, you're forced into a kind of vertical high-rise paradigm and density. So the hike thing, in my view, is a Trojan horse to get this thing going. It's really uh, an attempt uh, to redevelop uh, Dharavi to open up 50% of the land towards profit, uh, as that's the, that's the incentive that he has in his mind that he's working towards. Now, what will happen? Uh, I, I, I actually I don't think anything will happen for the next five or ten years. But beyond that, in the condition we are in Mumbai, you can't predict. Uh, but we don't. The, the, the capacity doesn't exist. Uh, I think the consensus doesn't exist. Uh, I think civil society is very vocal, and she showed you all the, the methods and the instruments that can be employed to slow the process down. Uh, uh, very good. You will know the numbers. See, of this. See, uh, a basic political economy fact is what the adjacent land within view of Dharavi yeah. in Bandarapulla yeah. is so, worth. That's right. And so, how much so, finance it takes. So, so, that that so, yeah. so, so Dharavi sits next to a property which is the alternate central business uh, the alternate business district for mumbai very close to the airport which is being pitched for the diamond market for you know all sorts of things and the prices there to buy a square foot of built up space is in the region of 30 to 50000 rupees uh, which is a thousand dollars a square foot, thousand dollars a square, which is ridiculous even by global standards. Essentially, so, the value of what these people are saying. Yeah. So, so, so the t so the temptation to 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 to, and that's why that's a Trojan horse, which is about education and benefit to the city, but it's really a development project. And uh, I think the problems are that uh, uh, the the groups that are opposing this are. Are, are evolving in terms of their own articulation of the problem. And that's been part of the problem, uh, because there hasn't been clarity in expressing uh, what the pitfalls of this scheme are. That's one. The second is, and I think this is what I was trying to allude to in my discussion, and I would like Arjun very much to respond to this, which is this middle ground of professionals, of of, of, of people who might be able to engage in bridging this gap between the hardness of the bureaucracy and people on the ground who can't quite recast their arguments uh, to counter the technical arguments you know, of development uh, that the bureaucracy sets up in terms of regulations and things, which a developer like Mukesh Mehta has the savvy uh, to kind of use to his advantage. Uh, and I think just my last comment would be that, I mean, what's happening in Mumbai 
is a kind of process of what I describe as an urban involution. It's getting internally more complex rather than diversifying into more um, evolutionary modes in a sense. So, and what I tried to show there was that as our, our engagement with the metropolitan region is increasing, our planning mechanisms are diminishing. The instruments of planning in terms of capacity, agency, uh, and all of that. And this is an incredible contradiction uh, because really the solutions of Dharavi don't lie in Dharavi. They are about. So some, we just had a conference and a workshop when we were all in Mumbai and uh, a lawyer there who is also an activist sort of was uh, to, in response to some questions about squatting and the dynamics of it, said, look, imagine the New York metropolitan area and imagine if you snipped off the bridges that connect you to New Jersey and all the connections of mobility in the larger region uh, and people have jobs in Manhattan, Central Park will be encroached on. People want to live where they're close to. And so you, you can actually imagine that in reverse. And when I talk about diversifying into other modes, it really has to do with public transportation and other infrastructural dispersions, which create a more dynamic system uh, that allows dispersal of jobs. But until we do that, we're just going to get internally more complex, which means we're susceptible to malfunction. And I think all of this begins to come out of that impulse rather than the impulse to diversify into other more dynamic modes. Is there anything on this thing? you want to come in on here? Well, I'm, you know, just referring to uh, Dharvi and then going back to what uh, Arjun was saying yesterday about unbuilt city. I mean, and this is not only particular to Dharvi, it's particular to all these slums. That, you know, uh, this is what uh, the sociologist calls the unintended cities. You know, these are places which were not supposed to be there. Um, and 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 these people are not supposed to be there. Uh, the idea, as as far as the bureaucracy is concerned, as far as the uh, uh, the government is concerned, these slums shouldn't exist, and these people shouldn't exist. Uh, these people represent a mode of life that is not needed in a modern uh, developed economy. Uh, they represent forms of life that you know are not needed. And so they've always had, I mean, the, all these slums have always functioned uh, under this kind of shadow of not uh, being wanted. And then you get successively, I mean, you know, it's Mukesh Mehta today, it'll be somebody else tomorrow. I mean, all these uh, places then get uh, various kinds of schemes, whether it's SRA now or it's something else. Uh, else. And, and, the, and the thing is that, you know, these uh, communities are left to uh, be in a kind of reactive mode. Uh, that is, stop this, stop that. Uh, on the other hand, if you actually study uh, how these communities have come up and what they do, I mean, they've established a very thriving, living form of urbanism, which is not dependent on any government subsidy, not dependent on any uh, urban planner, uh, not dependent on any authority, and they have, uh, you know, I mean, Dharavi, in, in my sense, is pure Mumbai. I mean, it is where, on the one hand, you see free enterprise at its kind of uh, rawest, uh, and also you find urban solidarity, uh, a form of kind of urban, uh, you know, sociality. So, uh, so the question for me is really is, what is the process by which the urbanism that you actually see in existence over there, which is normally seen as you know something that we don't want, is something that you know uh, you know there's a political process that uh, you know picks that up and says this is what we need to learn from, and this is we what we need to put on the table rather than saying oh should we have you know uh, you know another Mandrakulla complex or or and stuff like that. So Gita, before I hand over to you, can I just say one thing here? Because I agree very much with the second half of what you've said, but not with the first half. And I just want to clarify this. Zen said, where I live in Bombay, there's a large slum in front of the house. Property prices are where we live. We live in the same area. What is there? What, per square foot is what? In my uh, roughly? It would be the same as yeah. I described for this. Yeah. $1,100 a square foot. All right. In this, in this area, we used to have, we have the slums still, 
But the slum has developed its own life. So it's no longer simply happy. There are these Xerox places where you can Xerox. There are, um, you know, um, cyber cafes. There are tailors. There are barbers. There's a whole life that actually now supplies services to the people who live, like my mother, just, you know, not directly from them, but near them. And if what I've been noticing is that the 15 years ago, the you know, Bombay heritage people, one of the spokespeople there was telling me, now what we've got to do with these interstitial spaces is to give them all the infrastructure and they can become Mediterranean, like little Mediterranean towns. This was the world used to it. Somebody wanted to move them all out. 15 years ago, his whole thing was get them out. Now he's saying this is absolutely ridiculous. They service us in so many ways. And they should not be moved. They've set up, their, there is a kind of real urban culture there. What surprises me is that they don't have, many of them, as you'd know better than I do, don't have the proper infrastructural things. So across from our house is a park, which then has the slum on the borders. One edge of that park, where people take constitutionals, the middle class take their morning constitutionals, is an open latrine. And so when I go, I take the short course so I don't have to. But people who live there take the long course, pop their handkerchiefs up for a bit. And when I complain even to my mother, she says, well, this is ridiculous. You know, after a while, you don't even smell it. Or you take a perfumed handkerchief, you put it to your nose and you walk past. So I'm becoming anachronistic in that area. My mother has no problem with it. She's adjusted. She, she's completely adjusted. She said the nice thing is now I don't have to go to the fort if I need an electrician. I get an electrician in two minutes. So I'm suggesting that lives, there is a greater sense of proximity, and rhetorically at least, a kind of ethical proximity to. My mother and a number of people now say, why get rid of you know, they, They're doing a, they change from being squatters you know, who were left over after the building boom, to now being agents, at least in, in my n n narrative experience. Yeah, that kind of proximity uh, is the same thing. For me, I grew up in a building called Darya Mahal, which uh, those of you here from Bombay know, it's this very large complex uh, right near the sea. And so it was three very large buildings, and we had a system of underground garages when the complex was built um, in the early 70s. Um, and so each car, um, each resident was allowed one car and one underground garage. But of course the car had to have a driver. So um, where would the driver sleep? Well, in the underground garages. The drivers had families in uh, the provinces and over time they started bringing their families who also started sleeping in these underground garages. But then the families grew so numerous that was that there was no room for the cars. So <laughs> the cars uh, got put on the roads. And over time, the underground garages got completely occupied by the drivers and their families and their descendants. Um, we used to play cricket uh, on uh, top of these garages. There's a sort of uh, cricket ground. and. Uh, because there were all, all these drivers living underneath, the people in the building refused to maintain the garages. And uh, one monsoon, the cricket ground gave way. So now you can see these extremely expensive flats along the sea. And underneath it, because the ground has been removed by the monsoon, uh, you can see the underground garages. So it's like a cross section, like a doll's house. The informal city right underneath the formal city, and the people, they're, they're no longer drivers now because you know, they, they don't drive their cars. So they're electricians, they're tailors, they're the people who service the people living above them. Uh, and it's a pretty dramatic example of what's legal and what's not. And as Leza pointed out, the way they maintain their status, the way they maintain, they, they keep from getting elected is they participate actively in the democratic process. I was in Bombay for two general elections when I was writing my book. And once I went around with a local BJP a member of parliament who was campaigning for re-election. And she came to my building and went straight for the underground garages and campaigned among all the tailors and electricians and so forth. And not once did she go up into the buildings to the legal residence. 
And when I asked her campaign manager why, he said, well, if those people ever come down to vote, then we would go up down, uh, up to them to solicit their votes. And if you look at the voter registration rules, you see that the peop it's the people from the slum areas. The, the, during the elections, it's, it's, there's tremendous political activity. There's voter participation rates exceed 90%. And among the rich who can control politics through other means, with the power of the money, there's much less uh, actual voter participation. And I also found that people in the slums, as Lisa points out, they're very strategic about using uh, <coughs> the political process. So corruption has different meanings for them. It's got different meanings for the middle class and different meanings for uh, uh, the people living in the slums, many of whom are middle class. So I'll just give you one example. There was uh, a Congress party um, uh, campaign worker uh, and the Congress had been the incumbents in the state. And he, I listened to him appealing to a crowd saying, we have been in power for six years. Um, we have eaten a lot. So vote for us because we are not hungry. We have eaten so much, that is we have taken so much in bribes, that the Shiv Sena who, if you elect them, they are hungry and they will eat more than us. <laughs> and the crowd perfectly understood this logic. Corruption as a system, as the normality. Yeah, can I just sort of, uh, I think you said something very important which is worth picking up, which is you said they're now actually middle class. Now that's very important because it's about changing aspirations. So till the slums that we are talking about, the informal city, they provide the amenities. T till the fact that aspirations are only about being in situ the politicians have one set of accountability. The fact that now this is actually the middle class, and that's the reason why these new imaginations of the city are what the politicians are throwing up, because the middle class wants a predictable city with amenities, and that's why I was using the word amenities, which is missing in the vision documents. And they want predictable schools, they want uh, health care, they want transportation, and mobility is the best in direct subsidy on housing, so they want the area to be dispersed in a way that they have options. And that will change the politics. See, only the noises of the politicians towards Singapore and Shanghai has to do less with actually the global city, but has to be more with what they're pandering to the imagination of the middle class. And I think that's where design and planning has to desperately reinvent itself in this form of this engagement. And that capacity, the lack of that capacity, is really the big crisis. Can I say one thing, um, Rahul? You know, you showed and those advertisements, and you said that here yeah, you have the object without the environment, the environment without the object. Well, the advertisements only will get people as far as going to visit. Once they go to visit, then they see exactly where it is. Yeah, then they see that the, 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 the asset producing plant is next to where they're living. So I didn't quite get the heft of that point. I can see it at the visual level, you know. Of, uh, uh, the, but having seen the conditions in which people live in New York City, uh, in which middle class people li live in, uh, you know, in the East Village even, very trendy, near the most, it doesn't surprise me at all that somebody, it, it, when you think of where people will live, it's always where are they coming from, not yeah, only yeah. where are they coming yeah, to. And I just wanted to yeah. put that yeah, there. No, I no, think no that's absolutely, sufficient. and it's also a demand supply. Yeah. Sometimes it's so desperate that it doesn't matter. It's just interesting how the developer areas is the context, no, the public's imagination. Toilets, and we talked about, I mean, toilets in some of the, and I've visited several on the, the, in the, in the, in the, on the Lower East Side, unless you come from a very aristocratic British family and know how to ride a horse side saddle, <laughs> like the Queen, you can't use the toilet because there's nowhere to put your legs. You've got to sit and do it. People really will tolerate in an um, enormous amount. It all depends on what they're leaving behind. No, that's the reason, just to sort of, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's the reason the politicians are now appealing to the middle class imagination because the poor, I mean, the rich are, they can be above it all and escape. And for the poor, the measure is where they're coming from. Yes, that's and right. And so it's only getting better even in the squalid conditions. Yeah. And so, yeah. So one of those places that you show <coughs> in Ville Parle or wherever, you know, even if it had a yeah, yeah. No, gin no. next to it, it's not. So the, ob I just wanted to, that object environment issue, I take a little issue with. Arjun, would you like, to, oh, sorry, yes. Oh, no, okay, no. Please. no, please, no. Um, then. Well, I was just really curious about the theme of temporality that seemed to go through all four of your talks in really different and interesting ways. 
and um, how Rahul, when you talked about um, sort of a failure of planning, it, it seemed almost as if the sort of temporal city um, represents a failure of planning because planning sort of determines a um, static, for lack of a better word, I don't think that's the right word, um, idea of the city. But I wonder if instead we could imagine this kind of kinetic or temporal urbanism as a new way of thinking about how planning actually could work. And the idea of durability, I think, really brings that up, almost that that, that constant transformation and jostling and windows of opportunity um, provides an opportunity for durability as opposed to um, a more conventional planning. I'm just curious what you guys think of that. Uh, I, I mean, I think that the theme has come up several times of this tension between um, this, the temporary nature and the permanent nature of some spaces and the ways that they come into contact with one another. And I think in terms of the lived experience in a space that was intended to be temporary but it becomes permanent, or you think of it as permanent but you fear that it's only temporary and it may be taken away from you. I think, is, I think that there's something attractive about it, but that's, it, it's anxiety producing. I think it's a very difficult condition under which to live. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it's something that people who live in these spaces that operate between the temporary and the permanent um, live with and, you know, do amazing jobs coping with it. But I think any of us would, would find that too difficult to bear. I, think. Mm -hmm. no, 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 I, I totally agree. And I think my interest is twofold. One is from the perspective of, of just sheer efficiency and therefore sustainability and all of that because these, the, the, the elastic margins make for a, a much more kind of nuanced as well as efficient use of space, space building, symbolism, you know, shifting <coughs> meanings, all of that. But I think my real interest in, 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 in landscapes like that lie in a kind of absent discussion in planning, which is how you make the transitions. Yes. So you have a given state, and then you have a preferred state. Mm. We never discuss transitions. And this could be a very, uh, I think this could be a powerful tool in imagining transitions, perhaps. Well, I think many of these communities are self-planned cities. That is, they mm. decide, uh, when I was going around in the Jogeshwari slums, um, they would, uh, show me where they planted uh, the same trees of the specific province that they came from in Uttar Pradesh, would have the same deities, and they would rename the ditches uh, after the rivers <laughs> of the states that they came from. So they took that geography and actually transposed it because it made them feel comfortable. Also, when we talk about slums, it's interesting that the Marais in Paris, or Trastevere in Rome, or the Lower East Side in New York, were all considered slums 100 years ago. And as this, um, uh, there was a friend of mine who uh, lives in the Lower East Side, and her old Jewish grandmother came to visit once, and she explained, I spent half my life trying to get out of that place. <laughs> uh, so I think that might be something to this suggestion where, you know, you don't demolish the slums, improve them, give mm, these people mm, tenure, mm. and uh, figure out some way to respect okay. the kind of uh, planning that they've already done, the, uh, where the it's not a grid pattern, it's um, kind of curly cued and it's uh, low rise, um, and figure out some way of involving them in the planning process rather than bringing in international consultants. Um, just to make this, haven't in your current book that you're researching, this if I remember our breakfast correctly or our lunch, you found s similar things in New York. Yeah, the things are happening very much like this in New York. I've been looking at the redevelopment plans around Coney Island. There's a four and a half billion dollar plan to uh, redevelop Coney Island. And they brought in an Italian developer to demolish, uh, who, in, who, who brought in new rides. And the first thing he did was got rid of businesses on the boardwalk, like Shoot the Freak and the famous Ruby's Bar, that have been there for 76 years. Um, and it's the same kind of logic, you know, we must have progress with uh, this. Um, they were specifically evicted because they had building code violations. Uh, and it's true that a man went into Ruby's on Memorial Day a couple of years ago and fell through a six foot hole uh, in, in the bathroom. But you know, these are minor things. <laughs> um, but that, uh, this was happening all around New York. There's a, there's a big flea market in the uh, parking lot of the aqueduct, which has been around for 30 years, which services the immigrant communities around there, 
which is now uh, just it, uh, these people who have been there for 30 years have all been evicted in favor of a Malaysian casino. Um, um, so, you know, it's, it's, we see these processes in city after city, and there's got to be some respect for continuity. There's got to be some respect for historical memory, because without this, there is no Bombay. But you know, can I? It's not only the, the, it's not only memory. It's the way in which traditional practices are dealing with the transition. So it's not that it's memory and, and, and contemporaneity. There are these things that are happening. They're finding, people are finding ways of extending the past into the present. And it is those projects that are more threatening than some archaism, if it's what. It's the mixture of the past and the present as a transition, which always creates a much greater anxiety. Yeah. You, sorry, I didn't know your name, and then, yeah. Okay. Um, actually, uh, first, I just wanted to say that it was great to kind of hear all these lectures as kind of, um, I'm not that familiar with Bombay, but I think a lot of themes that were shared clearly resonate with a lot of other parts of India, and specifically um, in Delhi, where um, uh, at the School of Planning and Architecture a few years back, we had a series of uh, lecture, uh, a series of studies uh, titled such as, uh, where does your dhobi live, and where does the Babu had his chai samosa. And for those who understand English, uh, mm. India, I'm sorry, I think they can understand what I mean. But it basically dealt with the same issue that the middle class really was dependent upon the services of these people that were all around them. And as a part of the study, uh, as one of the students involved in it, and what we found was that uh, there was a real lack in the master plans of the space that was allocated for these informal vending markets in the city. And one of the proposals or recommendations uh, at that time in undergraduate school was in future plans, you know, we should they should look at it and allocate more space, which is more representative clearly, of what the population needs are in that area. And yet, as all this was happening, Gurgaon was coming up and they were building all these malls and all around them, all these markets were coming up because as the kind of rich guy goes inside the mall to shop, where does the driver get his cup of tea? And so my, my point was, is that, uh, first point is that, I mean, it seems like that architects and planners have a role to play here, they can design places, but is it something that can be planned for, or will the informal kind of nature of the city, the attraction of Mumbai in places like Delhi, will it make it impossible for planners and architects to plan for that kind of insurgence of, you know, like the kind of attraction of people and overwhelming, in overwhelming numbers? And the second was what, picking up on what Rahul said, that do we need to educate planners and architects um, in a slightly different manner as what we're doing right now, rather, do they need to be, uh, what are our kind of thoughts on what kind of education that they should get in school to be better prepared to tackle such challenges? <laughs> we're trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, I think what you're pointing to is, I mean, we, we implant other paradigms, no? And I think that really is what you're reacting to in a sense. And what happened in Gurgaon, it's impatient capital that has to get mana. We look at Dubai then because they got it right to be able to build quickly kinds of buildings, all of that. And I mean, I think I also go back into the point I made about transition. So, I mean, the kind of flux we are seeing in terms of the growth of our cities, the nature of the demography uh, that sort of is moving to cities differently in different places. Um, is, I mean, is that going to be a permanent state? Uh, are we in a transitionary mode? Uh, and that's why the temporal landscape, I mean, making our planning more nuanced and, and how we can make different paradigms actually coexist in synergy uh, is perhaps the real challenge for our imagination. Uh, and, you know, we also talk only of mega cities. And, you know, one of the projects we are trying to get going here is looking at India's 300, 400, 100,000 people cities, which are going to become a million si people cities. And that's the urban time bomb that, you know, we are sitting on. We don't look at that. That's where we can intervene, which are less contested. So, I mean, it's, I think, many multiple things that have to be addressed. But I don't know what the answer about education is yet. Lochi, we are not in a, term in a transitional phase, but a terminal phase. Do you have anything to say? Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 Don't let him do this to you, Luke. Anyway, what I want to know is you're talking about the protest groups, both the Rampo and Lisa and perhaps the others. 
So how many people in the rally want to stay there? Mm. Or you, what I, I don't want figures in there. Yeah, yeah. Do most of them want to stay there or like the grandmother who's trying to get out of there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. figures. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have figures, obviously. Invent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told to invent figures. <laughs> Let Bombay speak but, through yeah, you. Right, exactly. <laughs> Bombay will speak through me. <laughs> but, uh, Did you not say 53%? <laughs> <I'm> right. <laughs> I'm... Uh, there's a lot of diversity in Dharavi, and that's something that, uh, you know, in all of these settlements, and that's something that these big, you know, uh, comprehensive plans that homogenize the populations don't really account for. There are people who want to remain in Dharavi because they work in proximate locations to Dharavi, and they do want to remain there. There are others who Ha who don't necessarily need to remain in Dharavi, but, but you know, that's where their social networks are, their political networks, their economic networks. And, uh, and I think there's, you know, their space issues are more important than their locational issues. I think like, uh, yeah. even just go one step is a really crucial question yeah. that affects all of these slums, which is that with all these variations in mind, Almost no one that I know of in Dharavi mm -hmm. has a secure plan for where they'll go if they leave. Mm -hmm. yeah. Therefore, they want to stay in Dharavi. Yeah. So some, of course, have that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Workshops, and there's that. Some don't. But yeah. hey, where's the next address? Yeah. That's so essential. that's the biggest reason I want to say I'm not moving. Stay put? Yeah. Yes. So um, it's, not, it's not an open option to say, well, you're not at least. Well, the, option? the other, the other thing so that most people, I, I believe that I, as a man, yeah. will come to the answer, <laughs> would like to stay if nothing else, as a choice. And if the yeah. vertical option were presented to them? Uh, that's different than its affordability, how many people... Yeah. Well, they would have to make some, you know, they, would, they wouldn't get the land if they didn't yeah. make it available. Yeah, you know, the light board some have to go... That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that is not discussed about Dharavi and not even mapped accurately is the rental market. That's because true. there is a huge land mafia there. So that is the, that's why the 30% or the 70% that agree, yeah. what yeah. percentage is the land mafia? Not because just because the, of the fact that the people who get slum housing to our so Mumbai It's a very difficult question. Renting out their places. So yes. You get housing and then you rent it out to the middle classes. So people I'm like Park say don't get people a common that. toilet because if you have to everybody toilets, everybody rent out those places, somebody's going to pay more. No, I, I think what, uh, one crucial Who will rent them? This is sounding a little bit more like Bombay than we want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do want the voice of the people. Just yes. put your cell phones <laughs> on. Nobody can understand. Whip it up. Whip it up. Yeah. Now listen. The other thing is, there's a question coming. Question is what? Question is? Question is? Question is? How many people? Who is speaking for the 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 people? Who is speaking how many people? Are there people who, is there a movement saying, are no we change. represent the people who want to say? No, oh, 62 and a half percent people want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Most people would want to stay if yeah. they don't know where else they're going. Well, you want us to wrap? Okay, we have to wrap. Thank you all very much.